All right, hello everybody. Thank you for joining me for the pre-T shift. I'm gonna do my very best to keep you all awake, but I offer absolutely no guarantees. So before we kick off, the perfunctory who am I? My name is Robert Lynn. I work for Mobius Binary. I live in Cape Town. I like random facts, retro video games, and beating the system. And I know I've got a cue from my director, just to mention Mobius Binary is hiring, if anybody is interested. So I am actually a returning speaker. Um, I spoke at a B-Sides in 2016 on a wildly unrelated topic. Um, so yeah, coming back here, it is still absolutely as nerve-wracking being up here. And I'm still filmed, filled with an overwhelming sense of imposter syndrome. So here we go. But from 2016 until now, I still have my beard. So in an ever-changing world, that has remained constant. So this feels like a, a sort of dating website, you know, where I'm telling you all about myself. Like I like um, video games and long walks on the beach and pina coladas and all of that. So once we're talking about confessions, you've heard some of my personal confessions, confessions and caveats. Let's talk about some regarding this presentation. So first up, the data in this presentation was part of academic research, so please don't hold that against me. If anything, pity me for it. The presentation is not going to be all the research, thankfully, for you and for me. There will be snippets of it. Although, as the heading is, got to do with crypto, I am not a crypto enthusiast, actually. And the idea for this talk, like all good or and bad ideas, came out over a couple of beers. Is this possible? Can we get an idea about the world of crypto jacking? It's going to sound a little academic-y, because it is. But I'm going to do my best to not make it sound that much. And while I will share the results, it's really more about the process. And, and with that process, hopefully I can help somebody else with a similar project or a similar idea or something like that. So the state, unfortunately, is not the current state as of, the 20, as of 2022. It is a little bit older, and we can thank COVID to that, because I would have really liked to present this back at the time that I actually did the research. But it is entirely repeatable, so if anybody else wants to, please go ahead. And it's not an in-depth talk about crypto, not at all. If anything, it's an inch deep and a mile wide and not the other way around. So when we're talking about the prevalence of crypto mining and crypto jacking, what exactly are we talking about? And in the context of this talk, it is a monetization process in which the visitor of a website's computer, computer, computational resources are used to mine cryptocurrencies for the owner of the website or somebody else. So it is an attack, can be an attack, but it can also be legitimate and so therefore a process. So with anything like this, there's always a couple of ethical questions. And first up, how did this crypto mining stuff get onto the website? So there's a couple of ways it could have got there, that somebody could have breached the site and embedded it in the code. The webmaster himself could have put it there without any consent, or the webmaster could have put it there and asked for consent, do you mind me mining crypto while you visit my site? So consent is a, is a tricky one, especially in this regard, because it's really difficult to ascertain whether or not the end user even knows what they're consenting to in the case of it being one of those sites where the webmaster openly puts it there and tells you that he's doing it and asks you to consent. So a couple of studies have been done around it. Bleeping Computer did one where they revealed an enormous percentage of users actually didn't mind their resources being used to mine a bit of cryptocurrency in the background as long as those pesky ads aren't being displayed. But once again, are, do they really know what they're consenting to? The Pirate Bay tor torrent search engine, which I'm sure nobody here has ever used, they were caught out using some crypto mining stuff quite a while back without even amending their privacy policy. And after that was released, they put a little cheeky caveat on the site saying, well, do you want ads to display or can we do you mind a little CPU cycles being used for, you know, for us to mine? So the ethical questions are there. If anybody really wants to talk about them, we can chat about them a little later. But back to the actual talk, what are we talking about? And so it really is how prevalent browser-based crypto mining is on the internet, which mining variants are preferred 
for crypto jacking, which internet service providers, which countries they're in, which currencies are used, and most importantly, the process as to how I got to all of the above. And of course, to fit into the B-Sides 2022 mantra, it's all done from home. So the result, which hopefully is a data set containing varied and hopefully accurate and relevant crypto mining and crypto jacking data, a repeatable process that anybody else can facilitate and continue enriching such a data set, and a data set that can be used for a visual representation. So some of the technologies that were used, and when I was making the slide, I was like, damn, I'm sure I used so many more, but actually pretty simple, pretty, pretty basic stuff. And we've got Bash, we've got Python, we've got Python Pandas Library, Multigo, Jupyter Notebooks, Neo4j, Virus Total, and the last icon is the MaxMind geolocation database used to map IP addresses to geolocations. So when we talk about they in the context of this talk, what are they talking about? What are, what are they that we're talking about? They really is browser-based crypto mining scripts. And we can go really deep talking about these crypto mining scripts and, and there's a lot of depth to it. That's not the intention of this talk. It really, in a simplified version, it's mining code embedded into a website source code that makes of the makes use of the visitor's CPU during that visit. So now that we know what we're looking for, kind of, I mean, the embedded mining code in websites, how do we find all these different variants and all these different crypto mining scripts? How do we know what we're even looking for? And the last thing I wanted to do was go on a large study and try and find every single one of these scripts out there. I think it would take me forever. So luckily I came across a really, really useful list called the, the NoCoin ad block list. If anybody's heard of it, very useful. And it's commonly used in a lot of these plugins, extensions, browser plugins, even for phone devices. And what these do, these plugins, you install them. And when you visit a site that has any of the embedded crypto mining scripts, it will pop up and say, hey, this site has a script. It's going to mine cryptocurrency off your browser while you visit it. And these, these extensions are powered by this wonderful little text file known as the NoCoin list. At the bottom of the site, you can just have a look at it. And for reference sake, that's what it looks like. I know that's, that's really difficult to see, but it is a text file just with lists and lists of different mining variants. And yeah, these text files plug into the, into the extensions and they warn you if you're hitting a site with them. So fantastic. Now I've got a list of these, of these variants, these mining variants. I know what I'm looking for. But here I get hit with the, the real big problem. That was the easy part. How on earth am I going to find them in the world of the internet? And, and this part started really bothering me. I thought, oh God, what have I done? So my options, and I started searching around and checking out for some vendors. VeriSign and PIR, they will give you DNS zone files for .com, .net, and .org domains. You do have to fill out a couple of forms to prove that it's for academic research. So that was the option that I was going to go with. Then I'm thinking, okay, I've got to now crawl all these websites download all the HTML, I mean the landing pages at a minimum, and then match all the source code with my entries in the NoCoin list. And I mean, that, that, that's horrible, that's horrible. So thinking about this, oh my God, what have I done? I've got, I've got to crawl yeah, a total of 128 million domains. Um, I mean, the bandwidth required to do that, I couldn't even start figuring out the storage space the actual computing power to sift through all of this. And at the time that I did the research, that NoCoin list had 587 variants that I was looking for. So I'm now looking for 587 variants in 128 million pages source code. How am I gonna do all of this? How am I gonna pay for all of this? And most importantly, I'm just freaking lazy, man. I don't really wanna do this. So poking around, I came across 
an amazing resource. I don't know how many of you have used it, but yeah, it really saved my life called publicwww.com. And that's me in the middle there thinking I'm going to be stuck with manually crawling the site. And then I see public WW coming along and I'm happy. And, and most importantly, this was supervisor approved from a research perspective. So I was given the go ahead to use it, which, which really made my day. So having a look at the site itself, just to give some context, it has the source code index for 504 million websites, which I mean, even kills what I would have been able to do in terms of 128 million. And it's got some other really interesting things that you can you can use it for. You can search for specific technologies in source code, sites with similar analytics ID names, WordPress themes, references to code or comments, even sites that mention your name. And no, I do not work for them. I have no affiliate deals, none of that. Just really, really useful. So before we get too stuck in, and too involved in the whole process, just a quick note on CoinHive because it comes up quite a lot. And CoinHive really was the crypto miner, the crypto jacker in this case's best friend because they provided these amazing services for you to embed your mining scripts into sites you own or sites you don't. And as people visit and their resources get used, you get paid. And literally their slogan was monetize your business with your user's CPU power. So there was, there was no hiding it. And also before we get too stuck in, Monero and, and CoinHive, just like perfect marriage. CoinHive was built for Monero, which is really the most useful, or at least one of the most useful uh, currencies for browser-based mining, being ASIC resistant and enabling CPUs, it was perfect for it. So we could, once again, we can go really deep on this topic. Not what I'd like to do, at, le at least not right now. But yeah, so the two of them, perfect, perfect match. So the way CoinHive would work is you'd sign up, get a nice token, include that in the API calls when a user comes to your site, that script is loaded, connects to CoinHive, authorizes the, the user's token to receive input for hashing. Once a valid hash is found, it's committed to the CoinHive pool, and then eventually they pay you 70% of that reward and pocket 30%, sort of like the poker table at a casino. They also had a couple other interesting services, a capture service, which was quickly shut out, and a short link service, all of these with delays on pages so that mining could take place in the background. But back to the actual research. So kicking off, I've got, I've got this access now. I've paid for this access to public WW, API access, which is about $50. And I've got my list of, from NoCoin of the variants. That's literally how I'm starting off. I've got nothing but a list of NoCoin variants and this access. And by just running my for loop, of every single, my for loop basically simply just takes every single entry in the no coin list, queries it, and what I get back is a CSV file of each of those domains, oh, sorry, each of those variants. So in theory, there could have been 587, that's how many entries there were in the no coin list, and this is an example of one. Um, so it gives you all the sites that have that source code in it, and it gives you a little rank as well after the comma, like an Alexa rank. So this is where I start plugging everything into Jupyter and Python Pandas. And from that initial kickoff, I found 27,981 instances of crypto mining scripts from that list. And of them, there were 25,204 unique sites hosting these scripts. Of that 587 files, entries in the file, 305 unique scripts were noted. So 285, I didn't even come across at all. And the top 10, which I refer to quite a lot as in top 10s here, really accounted for 76%. So a small amount of them really being the bulk of it. And if I compare the problems I had when I was worrying about how I'm going to do this and what am I going to use and crawling and downloading, I mean, this took 20 hours over five days and resulted 10 meg of raw data. So it was an absolute pleasure. So taking a look at some of these sites that had crypto mining, I thought let's match them up and see if there's any decent Alexa rankings, any, any popular sites that we might know that have crypto mining scripts in them that we didn't even realize. Not so much, but the Wiz products and the wizmarketing.com, bizarrely enough, were pretty high ranked on Alexa. I mean, top thousand is, is very impressive. 
and and they were hosting some some crypto mining scripts there. I've noticed I had a quick look through these again. It's been a couple. It's been a while, and FarmEasy.in number seven is still is still running and still doing its thing. So the most prevalent miners, no surprise, we did speak about was was CoinHive and AuthMine, and the two of them together make up 38% of the entire population of the miners. And AuthMine is run by CoinHive as well, or at least was, and that's the consensual version. So if you want to run this site and you want users to consent to having their resources used for mining, you can sign up for AuthMind, AuthMine. Interestingly, neither of them exist anymore. And in fact, as I was finishing up this research, they didn't exist either. They had closed down. So 38% of the market when you no longer exist is, is pretty good going. Um, previous research showed them having about 75 to 80% of the market tied down. So they were definitely the, the ones to go to if you were looking for your end-to-end -end crypto mining solution, browser-based. So taking the 25,000 unique URLs that I had, I thought now it's time to have a look at the IP addresses, see what I can, see what I can dig out of that. So DNS resolution was my, my obvious choice, and mass DNS is what I used for that. Of that list of unique URLs, about 15% were unresolvable totally. Um, over 3,000, so it left me with 21,984 IP addresses valid uh, that I can now have a look at. So I plugged those into the, the MaxMind, the GeoLite database, and I basically did a simple count of the number of occurrences of each of those geographic locations. And with that, I was able to find servers the number of servers, 91 different countries hosting crypto mining servers. South Africa had 106 IP addresses hosting crypto mining variants, which ranked 25th out of the 91. And just 12 of the countries were noted as just having one IP address. So the actual geolocation itself, having a look through the count and the top 10, the USA top in that list with 42%, followed by, interestingly, Iran, Germany, Russia, some of the usual suspects there. Those are the guys with the most servers hosting crypto mining variants. So at this point, it's worth just having a little checkpoint as to the data set I've got. So I've got domains, I've got the miners found on those domains, I've got the IP addresses, and I've got their geolocation. And that's the data set that I have at this point in time. So my goal now is to take this data set and enrich it a little bit more and pull some more data out of it, see what I can find, see where that goes. So the first thing I did was integrate it with VirusTotal. And just like some of the other services, VirusTotal is a really interesting and useful API service for academic research. So if you can prove that you're doing this for academic research, they'll give you free access to their API. And with that API, you can do some, some interesting stuff. You can get domain categorizations. You can check whether or not it actually exists in the virus total database. You can determine if there's any known malware samples associated with it. And you can get some DNS and who is information. So once again, just a simple for loop going through all my domains and hitting the virus total endpoint gives me examples like the following. So once again, I got a bit of a problem now, whereas before, during my initial loop, I had CSV files, loads of them, 587. I thought it was a lot. Now I've got 20,000 nested JSON files, one for each domain. And the fact that I'm working with Python Pandas data frames and I'm pretty much CSV centric makes things a little tricky. How am I gonna get this back in? How am I gonna add this to my data set? And so with enough messing around with Bash and enough grep and orc and TR, I was able to chunk it all together and put it back into a workable CSV file and import it back into my data frame. So that's just an example of what that data frame now looks like, the enriched data frame. You can see I've got the bit defender category, which is one of the domain categorizations. I've got the domain, which is really the URL, or at least the the first part of the URL, the, the force the force point categorization, the URL, the rank, 
the, mi the miner found, the IP address, and the geolocated country. So already a bit more of an enriched data set to work with. So looking at some of the actual domain categorizations, I know this is really difficult to see, but the main one for Forcepoint, which surprisingly is potentially unwanted software. So no surprises there. But other than that, we've got business and economy, newly registered sites, information technology, and actually compromised websites, which is this one here, which piqued my interest because that's most likely well, sites that have not put it there on purpose, sites that have been hacked and have, that, have had mining variants embedded anyway. The Bitdefender categorizations were a little bit sparser, not nearly as much data. Um, but similar type of, of categories, business, parked, blogs, computers and software, porn, and yeah, a couple others with not as many categorizations. So because these two were so vastly different in terms of data set sizes, I just looked at percentages. And with that, I could see that across both, there were definitely similarities, where Bitdefender and Forcepoint both had about 16 to 18%. Um, computer software and information technology, between six and nine, sex, travel, news and media, similar percentages of those domain categorizations. So we start getting an idea of what type of sites are actually hosting these mining variants. Excuse me. So firstly, apologize for the, the horrible annotation, but I am fiercely loyal to Microsoft Paint and I, Really, uh, that's the one I use. And so these are the top 10 endpoints, essentially the top 10 IP addresses that have domains with crypto mining embedded on them. So that first IP, I mean, has an enormous chunk, has you know over 2,700 domains hosting crypto mining on it, on one single IP address. And the reason I've circled them and the reason I've used different colors, um, the red I'm gonna show visually from an IP address perspective and the green I'm going to show from a data categorization perspective. And with this, I'm going to use Neo4j. Yeah. So first up, this is what this is the Neo4j prep. These are the nodes. So taking that, that Python data frame, I was able to turn each single entry into a different node, into a Neo4j node and then write the queries in order to visually show me what it looks like. So what we'll see next is basically the world, according to me, if you could visualize what crypto mining, or at least crypto jacking campaigns look like. So this is the first example on that list, case number one. Uh, this was the IP address that had over 2000 domains on it. So the red dots are the actual domains the green being the mining variant and the blue being the IP address. And so from a visual perspective, this is what that server looks like and how it's mining. The little blocks are the areas that I'll zoom in on just to give a bit of context so you can see what we're actually talking about. That being the IP address and that being the over 2000 domains hosted on it. And interestingly, these are all Iranian. And the other side of the coin showing the mining variant in this case, it was fisocroll.com. So continuing to visualize and to, to show the world what I think crypto mining looks like from my, my patent perspective, I took a look at one of the other IP addresses. And this one had an interesting strategy. So it was a single IP address, of course, with 238 domains split perfectly across two mining variants. And just to zoom in and give that context, we see the, the IP address, all the domains, and all the domains with that specific variant on it. Another pretty picture of it all, and this one actually being an endpoint that's a Google CDN. So it's an expected output in terms of all the different domains and all the vastly different variants used across these domains. So as opposed to it being a single IP address, it's actually a, a Google endpoint. And here you can see all those domains and all those different variants tied to it. And yeah, the closer screenshot giving that context.
So instead of actually showing you know, more patterns of IP addresses and hosting from an IP perspective, this is it from a domain categorization perspective, and this one I found particularly interesting. So this is a single IP address with 116 domains on it hosting crypto mining, but all the variants on this being authmined, which is the consensual one. So whoever's running the server and running these sites is doing it ethically as possible, as everybody would have to consent to it, and that makes sense. If you look at that domain categorization, at least in the top picture, it's all around shopping. And so these sites are less transient, less dodgy, been around a lot longer, and have been categorized valid. And so it makes a lot more sense having a look at these patterns. On the other side, a domain categorization example of a site that's certainly not running anything consensual shows you what that pattern would look like, where you've got 92 different domains and all sorts of different categorizations and different variants within them. And yeah, definitely not uncommon due to the, the transient nature of these domains, most of them being uncategorized and the ones being categorized being categorized as potentially unwanted software and, and pornography. Next, I thought I'm going to plug this into Multigo and have a look at these IP addresses themselves and see what they've been up to. So we know they're running crypto mining variants, but what other dodginess has been going on? And so using that virt the virus total API key, I can get two types of data back. Detected communicating samples, so samples that have communicated with IP address or actually downloaded samples. And plug it in gives me some interesting stuff. And so this IP address in particular is a particularly naughty one. It was number six on that list of the top 10 and it hosted 111 domains with crypto mining, but it actually had about 12 different hashes detected to it. So whoever was running the server was, was up to a lot more than just hosting crypto mining. They had all sorts of other malicious campaigns going on there. And I thought this is a, probably an area where there's potential for more research, seeing what's going on with these IP addresses and the ones that are diversifying their campaigns. So the last area I'm going to talk about is particular coin itself, particular area to dig into, and that being JSE coin. So JSE coin was third highest on the list of most common variants. And um, this one required a little bit more effort outside of my data frame. So I just created a new data frame just with the JSE coin mining variant and pulled HTML from all of those URLs. There were 1,700 of them. And the way that the way the JSE coin miner loads, it actually has the user's account number in it. So you can start tracking the user themselves. So we can see the bottom four all have the same account number, being 112173. And so this gives me some insight into the campaigns running, not so much the user themselves, but I can see how many different sites they have working for them and whether or not there's actually any value to it. So we're going to have a look at 112173 as an account holder and see if this is actually profitable as well as a couple others. So it turns out 112173 had eight domains working for him, whereas 15838 had 228 different domains with his user code. So this guy's got a lot of domains running, you know, running sites, code embedded, and I got wondering, is he, is he making any money of this, he or she, is this, is this profitable? And quite interestingly, JSE Coin, who's also since closed down, offer a, a developer API key that lets you query balances. So having a look at 15838, um, well, before I even get to his balances, I took a look at every single one of those domains. And every single one of the domains was this landing page with that domain for sale, an embedded Bitcoin exchange link, an advertising banner, and the mining script embedded. So whoever's running this was really trying to diversify their, their revenue. Not very pretty, not very uh, good looking. And that really proved it in his balances because 15838 had a USD balance of 55 cents regardless of those 228 sites with the, with the mining script embedded. Maybe he or she is withdrawing those funds. I'm not too sure. 
the other one we saw, the, the 112173, had a negative balance. So definitely not, uh, not making a whole lot of cash doing this. So I thought what I would do then is have a look and see actually who is out of the out of the user accounts that I do have access to who does have some money in the bank and one of the instances that being account number 9250 had two and a half thousand dollars in his in his JSC balance which really got me wondering what what site is this guy or girl running and it turns out it was the the brand money can't buy that no longer exists and it was ranked yeah over 300 million 30 million, sorry, in Alexa. So not a very popular site, but somehow that balance was pretty high. So the conclusion to draw from this is who knows where the rest of those funds are coming from because it's very unlikely that it was from crypto mining. So with that, I will send everybody off to tea with a couple of wild, well, a couple of conclusions and next steps. So the world of crypto jacking is, is wild, it's decentralized. There are so many different variants and so many different miners out there that there's really a lot of space to explore and research more. Uh, yeah, especially since CoinHive and JSC Coin are gone, there's a, there's a lot of place to rerun this and see how, what the ecosystem looks like now and who's taken up that space. There's also areas to look at in terms of crypto mining on phones, mobile phones, as well as into the profitability. We saw at least JSE coin didn't seem to be. As well as deeper trails around those individual IP addresses, what they're up to, what they're hosting, and are they diversifying with other malware, as well as into any specific variants. And so any questions, comments, or insults? Um, I could see it from the source code. So I could pull all the different URLs associated to each user account. Yeah. But now, yeah, they've closed down too, so. All right, if that's that. Yeah. Well, so what's really important to me was really the data analysis of it, was being able to have the problem and to how am I going to figure this out and how am I going to crawl the internet for a specific concept, a specific term without using Google and take that and put it into a data frame, manipulate data. So believe it or not, these are the highlights from my research. I could have gone into a lot of more uh, other areas that I didn't include that would have knocked everybody out. So yeah, these were the highlights from that. Yes. No. no. Not from my, not from the limitations of my research. So uh, there were lots of things I left out. I couldn't cover. I uh, couldn't cover assembly. I couldn't cover obfuscation. This was really the bare minimum. And from here, it's a point to potentially research more. Sure. Through university, through university, through academic. Um, no, not really. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately not. Yes. I mean, that's really decentralized and that's at an ISP level. And I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody's actively hunting and looking for them. It's really sort of up to the individual to get those browser extensions and those lists to protect yourself. But from what, what I covered it and what I found, nobody's, nobody's really looking at that level. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Then you miss it. So the no, the no coin updates periodically. 
in fact, even daily, I think that list. So this is definitely point in time. And it is that game of cat and mouse signature based. What you find today, you won't find tomorrow. Yeah, well, you wouldn't really be aware of it unless you are running some sort of detector or some sort of blocker. That's why a lot of these sites yeah, are out there. The Alexa rank sort of, even though Alexa's gone too, a lot of these technologies are, are done, was the area I was looking, are these popular, are these sites that we know of? Well, did I know of? And, and the answer was really no, besides the Pirate Bay. So it was, from what I found, it was webmasters who had signed up to the consensual service to use the consensual variant. So no one seemed to be offering consensual services with an unconsensual <laughs> variant. So, so CoinHive and Monero being by far the most prevalent gives you the option, go CoinHive and do it unconsensual, or go Authmine, same currency, same rate, but doing it ethically and consensual. Um, I don't. Only the JSC one that I looked at and that one sad user that had one banner and one, one embedded script for every single endpoint. But other than that, unfortunately not. Believe it or not, yeah, I mean, this research took me in the ballpark of eight, nine months to, to cover it all. So lots of areas to, to go deeper if, if anyone is interested. And, and if anybody wants all the commands, all the, the, the pandas, the Jupyter notebooks, yeah, the Neo4j queries, everything is, is open and free. I'll share that happily, should anybody be interested. All right, thank you.